Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. This is awesome. This is great. I love looking up. That's awesome. That's, uh, if I haven't met you yet, I'm sorry, but I'm uh, Kevin. I'm the student pastor here. And if we haven't met, it's okay because I've only been here like two months. Uh, I'm married to Pastor Danielle. She is somewhere around making sure everything goes nice and smoothly. She's covering for Pastor Laura as she's gone on her mat leave. And uh, again, I'm here as a student pastor. Uh, and we're so excited to be here. So excited to be here. I keep telling people every time I meet them, and they keep asking me as if I'm going to change my mind, how are you enjoying it? <laughs> as if I'm going to change my mind. And every single time I answer them, I love it here. Uh, my favorite part about Heartland is that we, uh, every single Sunday at 8 a.m., we come in and we start setting up all the awesome things that you see where it comes to worship or it comes to kids ministry or it comes to all the signs and the cafe and the, the coffee and the guest services. We, we come and we start setting up and I love serving alongside uh, all the people that do serve. So thank you if you do serve. I love to get to know you. Uh, if you don't serve, please serve. Frontline leadership coming up. Get a part of that. <laughs> so like I said, I am the student pastor, which means grade 6 to 12. If you are in grade 6 to 12, uh, I am your pastor. I am your guy. I want to meet you. I want to know your name. I want to hang out with you. Um, so if you are a student or if you have a student, please introduce them to me. I'd love to meet them. This Friday, we're actually starting the, our fall kickoff um, at the church office area. Uh, if you don't know where that is, that's okay. You can follow us on social media or you can even pick up a calendar outside uh, at the guest services and they'll have uh, the address of where you need to go each Sunday or each Friday, sorry, Friday 7 to 9 we'll meet. And we do uh, worship, we play games, we hang out, we talk about God, and we just have a great time to connect with each other, but also grow in our relationship with God. So I'd invite you, if you're in grade 6 to 12, to join us this Friday, uh, 2450 Mill Tower Court. Again, get the address outside, because, you know. Anyways, uh, as you probably have seen last week during the offering, we played a video up on the screen. It was of a bunch of craziness. There was um, our people, and there was uh, some kids, and we were doing a kids program. Basically, what we did is we took a group of young adults and students to Mark's Day to run a kids camp. And it was awesome. It was really, really cool. I, I have to say this. I am so deeply proud of the people that we brought. I'm so deeply proud of the people that we brought. They, they were able to share the love of Jesus, not only by making the program awesome, which it was. It was an amazing program. But not also, they also built relationship with the kids. That they were talking to the kids, that they were telling people about Jesus, and that the entire community was lit up by our presence. Mark's Day, the community that we were in was 300 people, and it was crazy because by the end of the week, 17 of them, they were kids, and they were hanging out in our camp. The entire community knew we were there, and we could be a light in the community of Mark's Day. Uh, one of the things that was my favorite moments that you didn't see in the video because we thought it wouldn't be okay to um, film there was when we went to the mall. We actually went to the mall as all of the students and we filled backpacks with hundreds of bags of candy. We filled it with hundred bags of candy. We brought a little note that just said, we appreciate you. We love you. Thank you so much for what you do. Um, here is the Mark State email in case you ever need anything. And we went around to every employee in the mall, hundreds of them, like over 200 of them, and handed them out to every single employee and said, Thank you for what you do. We know you receive complaints. We know you receive criticism. We know you have so many complaints against you, but we appreciate you and we love you. And there's a community that actually wants to resource you and be there if you, if you desire that. So that was one of my favorite moments when we were in Mark's day. And we don't do it for the gratification or we don't do it for how the thankful they are. We actually do it because of the impacts, the times that they had a big smile on their face or the times that they were actually <laughs> starting to cry and starting to be so thankful. It wasn't the gratification that we wanted. It was actually the impact the impact of telling them that they are loved by a community, that not everyone is here just to get something from them, that someone actually loved them no matter what. <laughs> and that's uh, the tension we deal with this morning. That's a tension that we deal with the truth that we are not perfect with the grace that Jesus loves us anyways. 
the, the truth that there might be complaints against us, but the grace that someone loves us anyway. This morning, we're continuing our series, The Heartbeat. And the heartbeat is, the, the series is all about putting our head up to the chest of God and seeing what his heart is beating for. What passions in his mind are, is his heart beating for us? Is his heart beating for Mississauga? Is his heart beating for the lost? Is his heart beating for the mall workers? What is God's heart beating towards? And the hope is that we would be able to challenge each and every single one of us to actually walk across the room, to go down the hall, to walk across the street and actually share that love with them. So this morning, the last message in the Heartbeat series is actually called Drop the Stones. Drop the Stones. And uh, we're dealing with this tension that we talked about earlier, truth and grace. And this story actually drops Jesus right in the middle. And he's tr- he's a- or they attempt to force him to choose either truth or grace. So this morning, if you have your Bibles, if you have the Heartland app, I'd invite you to turn to uh, chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. You can turn to that. If you have the app, there's also notes that you can follow along with. So download the app. It's a great thing. Um, the first verse is actually a continuation of chapter 7. And I, I thought about omitting it, but I think there's something that we can learn from chapter uh, 8, verse 1. See, chapter 7 Chapter 7 ends with um, the, the Jewish leaders and the Pharisees. They, were hi- they hired someone. They hired a group of people to go capture Jesus while he was teaching. So they went, the hired people went to go capture Jesus while he was teaching, and they heard Jesus, and they decided to abandon their plan. When they got back to the Jewish leaders and the Pharisees, they, they were like, hey, why didn't you do what we paid you to do? And these hired people just said, well, you know what? We have never heard anyone who has spoken like Jesus, so we could not do it. See, I believe that when we speak the gospel, there's something that changes. Even in that moment where they were hired to do something, it changed their life just to hear how Jesus spoke. And at the end of the story in chapter 7, the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders, they're, they're fighting whether Jesus is the Son of God or not. They're fighting and they're arguing and they're trying to figure it out. Right? And Jesus could have easily left where he was and joined the argument. He saw the hired people come in and leave. He knew what was going on. He could have easily left where he was after he was done teaching and went to go join the argument. But chapter 8, verse 1 is a continuation, and it says, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. See, the word but here is actually D-E, Greek. It's the Greek word D-E-D. Okay, so D-E, and it just means in opposition to persons or what had been previously said, but... See, when we understand the heartbeat of God, when we understand uh, what God actually wants, his wills, his purposes for our lives, things like joining an argument doesn't seem as beneficial. Understanding the heartbeat of God is asking ourselves, is this beneficial to my calling? And Jesus asks himself, is this beneficial? And it says, but Jesus, instead of joining the argument, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, likely to go visit his friends and rest. So as we continue, I'd invite you to look for the times that we say, but Jesus. Cool? Foreshadow. Awesome. So we're going ahead, and we're going into um, chapter 8, verse 2 to 1, and that's where our story began. I think it's really cool. The first two words, at dawn, is saying that Jesus is not shying away from this fight. He's actually going towards this fight, but he realizes things are more important important. So he goes and rests, but then at dawn, at the crack of dawn, in the next light, he goes out and he goes to the temple courts. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. 
At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and he asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Can we pray real quick? Let's pray. God, I pray right now that you would speak through the scripture, God, the scripture that we just read, God, that there is some new truth, God, that there's new life that you have offered to us. God, I pray that we would be able to see in the scripture today, God. I pray that you would be able to speak through me, God, that there was times in this week that you have spoken to me directly, God. May I be able to communicate this to this group. And God, would you speak to each and every single one of our hearts as we hear this message, God, as we, as we contemplate what is going on in this passage, God, would you speak to our hearts, God, would you inspire us and would you motivate us for more? Amen. <laughs> Amen. You ready? Awesome. All right, here we go. So without pointing to the person beside you, who here has experienced road rage? <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. And I'm not just talking about like getting out of your car and like running down the street and yelling. I'm talking about the times where like, like out of nowhere, you just kind of uh, like throw up your hands or maybe you like you instinctively don't not even thinking about it, honk the horn. Right. Or maybe you're just kind of muttering to yourself. I do this all the time. Windows closed. No one can hear me. And I'm just like, uh, 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 uh. Right? And just, I'm frustrated, I'm angry, and it's not something I decide to do. I don't get into the car and think to myself, hey, maybe I should go on the road and get mad at people today. I don't think that. None of us think that, I hope. <laughs> I hope we don't think that. But we don't get into our car and think, I'm ready to go on the road and get mad at people today. We don't think that. Instead, we get into the car and it's a reaction to something. So the other day, I'm driving behind, um, I'm driving down the road in this car comes into my lane without a sing signal. So without using his indicator light, he just comes into my lane. And at first I'm like, okay, no worries. He made his mistake, cool, no worries. And then he went from my lane to the next lane over. And even though he was going farther from me, because he didn't use his signal light for the second time, I just started to tense up a little bit. <laughs> I'm like, dude, you should not be doing this. <laughs> You're gonna get hurt. And, and then, the third time, as I'm pulling up to the stoplight, as I'm pulling up, there's not much room in front of me. This guy, without a signal, for the third time, merges right in front of me, and I'm like, Ehh. right? I'm frustrated, and I'm like, my hands, like, I'm tensed up the entire time, and finally my hands just go, ah, oh. right? My, my window's closed, and it's not like I made a scene or anything, but like, this moment where I reacted, See, when we are wronged, we are defensive with the truth. You should have used your signal. You should have allowed for me to space. You should have just merged afterwards. There wasn't enough time. You should have done that. When we are wronged, we are defensive with the truth. But I've also been on the other side of road rage. Right, when I've forgotten to use my signal, when I have merged without looking in my blind spot, and then the horn blares behind me, or I see some gestures with some hands, or I see some arms raised, or whatever it is. I, I do something, and I'm like, oh, they didn't like that. And in that moment, when I had made the mistake, I'd like a little bit of grace. See, that's our tension this morning. When we are wrong, we are defensive with the truth. But when we are wrong, we want grace. The Pharisees in the story, they're not bad people. They're not evil. They're misguided, maybe, but they're not bad people. They actually gave up a life of leisure and comfort. They would wash their hands meticulously. They would dress in certain garbs that was way over what they needed to do in a hot day. They would uh, wash their hands. They would go long distances. They would go pray. They would uh, avoid people who were sinful or diseased. These were people that gave up a life of leisure and comfort. These religious leaders, they were terrified of falling short of God. They're not bad people. They're not evil people. They're actually trying to protect themselves. They're trying to protect others because they're trying to follow the way that they know how to follow they're following the way that God has laid out for them to follow. And they're thinking, I'm doing the right thing. And then Jesus comes onto the scene, declaring that he is the son of God, doing things completely wrong in their eyes. And they're saying, we need to get rid of this guy. 
The Pharisees are not evil. They're misguided. They don't know the glory and the gospel of Jesus yet. But so many times we paint them in such a, a terrible light. John chapter 8, 3 to 6, it says, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? So back in these days, this law actually wasn't practiced very much. When you committed adultery, the result of stoning actually wouldn't happen very often because it actually took a lot to convict someone of adultery. You needed first the man, then the woman, because it takes two, and then you need two unmistakable witnesses, two people that without a doubt know exactly what happened. You need four people, and yet the Pharisees bring one. You need four people, and yet the Pharisees bring one. Where's the man? Where's the witnesses? Why did the Pharisees that knew the law very well, they were quoting it to Jesus, why did they that knew the law very well, why did they leave out three out of the four people? They bring the woman. See, in the story, although the woman is being accused, it was actually Jesus that was on trial. Even though the woman was standing there waiting to be killed by stoning, there was a group saying, should we condemn her, holding their stones in their hand? Even though she was about to die, it was not her that was on trial, it was Jesus. In their minds, no matter how Jesus responded, the Pharisee had him. The Pharisees had him. They gave him two choices, truth or grace. You can either condemn this woman, you can follow the law that we have laid out, the Mosaic law that God has laid out. You can follow the law or you can spare this woman and break our law. And they had him because either choice led to Jesus not being the son of God. If Jesus is the Son of God, then he could not go against the law. He had to uh, convict this woman of what she had done. That's what the law said. And, even, and if Jesus was the Son of God, in their eyes, he had to do it. And if Jesus is the Son of God, then he could not condemn this woman. John 3.17 says, For God did not send his, world into, uh, his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. He could not condemn this woman. Either of these choices lead to Jesus not being the Son of God. The Pharisees had him. It was a trap. It was a trap that they fell into. They had him. Sometimes we do this. We try to force our hand with God. <laughs> well, God, I know that you said love people, but th these people are doing something that you don't agree with, so because they're not doing something, you don't want me to actually share love with them, right? So I'm just gonna... <laughs> God, I know that you, you told me to go and to, to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and, and teaching them all the things that I've commanded you, but they believe in something else, so you obviously don't mean them. Sometimes we try to force our hand with God. This morning, I want to, to remind us that God does not fit into our box. That when he says to love people, when he says to go and make disciples, there is no conditions. We need to allow God to be God. Drop the stones. John 8, 6. It says, they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus, here it is again, but Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. Jesus, you must choose. Should we condemn her? They're asking him a question, prompting him, saying, you need to answer now. But Jesus bent down and started writing on the ground with his finger. But Jesus, in opposition to the things and the people that had been previously mentioned, he bent down to write on the ground. And this is cool because this is the only time in all of Scripture that Jesus is recorded to actually writing something. And the thing that frustrated me all week was that we do not know what he wrote. <laughs> 
in the entire scripture, this is the only time that Jesus actually was recorded writing something, and we have no clue what he wrote. And we can speculate. Believe me, I looked up a million theories. We can, we can speculate. Maybe he was just doodling on the ground. He was just drawing a happy face, stalling time, waiting for the Pharisees to do something different. He could have been writing scripture verses. Maybe he was writing something to convict the Pharisees, or maybe he was writing something like the law that the woman had broken. Right? Maybe he was writing the names of the Pharisees in an attempt to say, I know you. But we don't know what Jesus wrote, but we do know the response to what he wrote and what he said. This is what we do know, so this is what we're going to look at this morning. Jesus, the first time, he stoops down and he starts to write. And the, the Pharisees, they're not intimidated by this. They're seeing whatever he's writing. I have no idea. But they're seeing it, and they're not intimidated by it at all. So they continue to ask Jesus, should we condemn her? Should we condemn her? Should we condemn her? Jesus, why are you drawing a smiley face? Should we condemn her? And then it says, Jesus gets up, and he says, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. See, and it's cool because it's the Pharisees, and they know the scripture. Although they only brought one out of the four, they still know the scripture, and they know what Jesus is referring to here. Deuteronomy 17.7, 7, and it says this, The hands of the witnesses must be the first in putting that person to death, and then the hands of all the people. So first the witnesses, and then the hands of all the people. And since there was no witnesses of this sin, Jesus doesn't say, well, now we can't do it. He says, okay, now the hands of all the people. Let any one of you who is without sin throw the first stone. If you are not guilty, you can throw the first stone. But if you are guilty, join her. <laughs> this is hilarious. I love, love this. This is Jesus dropping the mic right here. <laughs> I won't do it. I feel like people might be mad. But... <laughs> If you are not also guilty of sin, you can throw the first stone. But if you are guilty, you might as well join her. John 8, 9 says, At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Imagine with me for a moment. A group of Pharisees that had come to convict a woman are gathered around in a circle. Jesus is doodling on the ground or doing whatever he's doing on the ground, writing into the dirt. They're in a temple. There's a stone floor with obviously dirt on the ground that Jesus could write into. They're in a stone temple. They're all holding their rocks ready to get ready to throw it at this woman. And Jesus says this, let any one of you who is without sin throw the first stone. And there was this moment where one person had to have been the first. They had to have been the first, and they dropped their stone. And you could hear the of the stone hitting the ground. You could hear the stone hitting the ground, and I'm assuming it wasn't a perfect fall. It probably rolled over to one other person, probably hit the foot of another person. <laughs> and it wasn't an altar call moment. It wasn't like now Jesus said, with all eyes closed and all heads bowed. This was not a moment. They were all looking around. They could see this. The stone dropped, made a big sound, started to roll away, and someone started to leave the room. All these Pharisees that are saying, we live up to the law, start to look around to see who dropped the first stone. And who is it? It says the older ones first. <laughs> the person with the most esteem, the person that had lived the longest life, likely had the most sin, realized this first, and then they left. <laughs> this is cool because what it does is it creates a ripple effect. When the first stone is dropped, and that the bang is made and the stone rolls across the ground. And as they see this Pharisee walking out of the room, they know that although they hold the law very, very close to them, that even they sin. See, sin has a hold of, the, of a, on us. When we sin, it actually disconnects us from others and it immobilizes who we were made to be. It stops us from growing spiritually. 
And it says this, when we confess our sins to God and to each other, the power of sin is lost. When we confess our sins to others and God, the power of sin is lost. Some of us here might be holding grudges. Some of us in here might be holding sin, and it actually disconnects us from others. We need to be confessing that to God and confessing that to others because, one, it loses the power of sin over our own lives, but it also loosens the power of sin over the people around us. It creates a ripple effect. And after the first stone is dropped, another is dropped, and another is dropped, until only Jesus is left with the woman standing there. Go now. Go now. It'd be easy if we stopped here. <laughs> It'd be such a great, easy passage if we just stopped here and said, oh, it's all good. Like, the crowd left, and Jesus chose grace over truth, and that's the answer, the end. That's not what happens. It'd be very easy, but that's not what happens. So the crowd leaves one by one until only Jesus is standing there with the woman. On any other day, this would have been half fantastic for the woman. Think about it. Any one of you, without sin, you have to leave. This woman's still standing there, about to be killed, and everyone clears the room. This is an awesome moment for this woman, except for this day, who the only person throughout all of history and all of the world is standing right in front of her who can convict her. The only person that can ever convict her is standing right there in front of her. And at that moment, oh, right, I can imagine that tension. What is Jesus going to do? John 8, 10 to 11, it says, Jesus asks, woman, where are they? And I want to stop here. When Jesus says woman, he's actually not doing something like derogatory or demeaning term. This is actually the term that he uses for his own mother. <laughs> when Jesus calls this woman, woman, where are they? He says, woman, where are they? He's actually giving her respect. He's giving her esteem. He's giving her something that she does not deserve. Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said, and then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Jesus calls this woman, woman, and he gives her something the law couldn't give. See, the law can actually point out our sin, but Jesus can forgive it. The law can point out our sin, but Jesus can forgive it. Just last week, I became an uncle. I know, right? Crazy. I was in Mark's day, and I started getting, like, probably a bajillion pictures of this uh, sweet, cute little girl, uh, Emerson. I don't have a picture, but if you have been with me for any extended period of time, you've probably already seen a picture of Emerson. But we love her so much, and we're carrying her, we're doting. Like, literally the other day, I was supposed to leave to continue working on my sermon, and I'm holding Emerson, and, like, I'm not wanting to leave, and I'm sitting on the couch, and she starts to, like, fuss, so I get up, and I'm walking around, and I'm so tired after a day of work, but I'm like, you know what? It doesn't matter because I love Emerson, and I'm just kind of like singing to her and doing all this stuff, and it's funny because I had this moment where my mom had said, it, it's weird because we love her so much, but we, she hasn't done anything. She cries. She poops. She eats. She cries again. She hasn't done anything to deserve it, and I even think of when she gets older, when she actually starts to get a little personality and she starts to disobey her parents, when the no phase kicks in. Parents are laughing. Students have no idea what happens. <laughs> but when she starts to be disobedient to her parents, will we still love her? Of course we will. Of course we'll still love this girl. She is, she's my niece. She's a daughter. She's a grandchild. We're going to love her so much. Even if she's disobedient, we're going to love her. Go and sin no more is actually not a condition of God's love. It's an offer of new life. God is not saying, I forgive you, but go now and live without sin. He's not saying these things are attached and that this is a condition. He's saying, I love you so much that I want to give you new life. Go now and leave your life of sin. Go and sin no more is not a condition of God's love. It's an offer of new life.
your pardon for your sin. And the only person who could condemn you in this moment, standing right in front of you, does not condemn you. He does not condemn this woman. Jesus doesn't dismiss her sin. He actually overcomes it. He doesn't say, he doesn't brush it under the rug and he says, it's okay that you committed adultery, but I still love you. He actually overcomes it on the cross. He overcomes it. And then he gifts us with new life. I'm going to call up the worship team. Naturally, we all lean towards either truth or grace. I assume the people that loved Jesus, the people that were following Jesus, that had seen the miracles of the water to wine and the loaves and fishes and the healings and the, the, the forgiving of sins, they probably would have leaned towards grace. They probably wanted grace over truth. And the Pharisees that lived their whole lives for truth probably wanted truth. Right? They're on the two ends of the spectrum, and we're, we're seeing what Jesus would have done and what he does in this scenario. He doesn't go truth or grace. He doesn't choose between them. He wants both. He goes for both, but he actually uses it through love. He's saying, I love you so much, I'm going to offer you new life. The story reminds us that we are more than what we have done. That this woman who has committed adultery is more than what she has done. She is redeemed. She is loved. She is saved by grace. We are redeemed. We are loved. We are saved by grace. Neither do I condemn you. I forgive you of your sin. Go now and sin no more. I have made you with a plan. I have made you with a purpose. I offer you new life. Go. This heart, this uh, series, The Heartbeat, has actually been our attempt to kind of try to share what, what was on Jesus' heart and how he loved and how he chose to make decisions in his life. And it reminds me of the Apostle Paul, who was once a Pharisee. He was, he was the guy that if we were to compare everyone, including the people in the story of how much you hated Jesus, he would probably be on the top of the list. He was, he was mean. And yet today we remember Paul, not by the mean things he did, but actually because he was the greatest missionary that had ever lived. He went and he built up people. He empowered people. He planted churches. And he shared the love of Jesus. And it all happened from a moment where Paul realized that the salvation that Jesus was trying to share with people was not just for the people that had committed these terrible, terrible sins. It was actually for each and every single one of us. The, the, the power of salvation was for Paul. And that changed the entire trajectory of his life. Jesus' heart is for people. Jesus' heart is for the lost. And Jesus' heart is for you.